from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and I'm joined once again. <laughs> Buzzy Cohen is back. One of these days you'll escape having to sit in a room with me and talk Never. about our favorite show. But for now, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere, you know? Well, we don't have much longer to talk about <laughs> season 39. It's coming to a near close Today is kicking off the final five games. Incredible. It kind of flew by. Really flew by. And having this podcast. Season and one. taking a deep dive week in and week out. And here we are, the little podcast that could. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I think everyone was really anticipating season 39 after what season 38 did. As was I. <laughs> yeah. And we had an incredible TOC. We had, you know, masters, celebrities. So much has happened. When we talk about the people, the champions that we had this year incredible stuff certainly people that i'm excited to see come back and also we're kind of starting to build this new jeopardy pyramid which is really exciting as well so we might see some people who maybe in their regular season didn't stand out as much emerge as incredible you don't champions. know who's going to emerge that's what's so exciting yeah. about this new structure and of course i've mentioned michael davies will join us in the pod because we've got some changes mm. brewing for season 40 and we're going to share that with you you're going to hear it first on inside jeopardy we're going to tell you all about it in the coming weeks but right now we have to highlight last week's games so let's cue those beep boops <laughs> We kicked off the week with returning champion Daniel Moore going for his second win against Jerry Powers and Leanne Cromer. It was an evenly matched but low scoring game throughout. Daniel was able to maintain a small lead for the entire game despite finishing the double Jeopardy round with under $10,000. But that small lead proved to be all that he needed. He gets final Jeopardy correct and he earns that second win. I was very excited about Daniel on that Friday when he had some great stats. Uh, yes. Very high percentage. 30 rate. correct responses. And I thought, wow. Maybe, you know, coming in on a Monday show, I don't know what the tape schedule was exactly, but either way, you're pretty amped. The Monday game is kind of tough. Well, we did tape all of these weeks. Back to back. You know, back to back. So we did so have four he, consecutive tape days. So Daniel had to go to his hotel, to his hotel. or wherever yes. he was staying and try to sleep that night. After Knowing being I'm a Jeopardy, a Jeopardy champion. champion, and I got to go back and do and it. And I had a great day. first game. I don't hold it against him. I, t I think it makes sense, but I'm glad he was able to put together a second win. There was a lot of anticipation for this game for me. Sometimes we do what's called a drop in category, it, mm -hmm. it needs to go in on a certain day. And we knew that the Oppenheimer category would be a drop in for this Monday game. So I looked at these three players and I said, all right, let's see what they know about Oppenheimer, because of course we had some pretty epic celebrities presenting <laughs> for this category. This is a category we've worked on for nearly a year. And, you know, the cast is its pretty robust. Yeah. There are a lot of celebrities in the cast. And throughout the year, they were throwing different names of who was going to be participating. We didn't know. But as it, you know, got closer, it turned out, oh, you're going to have Matt Damon and Emily wow. Blunt. And uh, I had the chance to fly out to Brooklyn. They were doing a photo shoot for the film mm -hmm. where they do a lot of the still photography for the film. And so we were able to record with them kind of in the middle of that shoot. And I have to say, couldn't have been nicer. Matt Damon remembered coming to the Jeopardy set early on, right after Goodwill Hunting. And, you know, so excited that he got to meet Alex. And the two of them wanted to do the category introduction together, which we had never really done a, a shared category introduction. But they were so fun with each other. And the first time they read it, they were very serious. And I was like, okay, you guys, this is... And Matt's like, oh, right, it's a game show. I was like, well, no, it's a quiz show. But they were joking. They're like, okay, okay. And so then they kind of brought a little more laughter and fun to it. <laughs> Although a serious film topic still... Yeah. You guys have to make this a little bit fun for our contestants, which they were absolutely able to do. Just sad that the category proved to be difficult for these three. So this begs the question, will there be a Barbie drop-in category? Because those are the two big films of the summer going head to head. Right? That's the social media thing, the Barbie Oppenheimer. Well, and I think there is a lot of, <laughs> a lot of rivalry. We stayed out of it. We just went All Oppenheimer. Right. Nothing says Jeopardy yes, you know, as like much a as a historical, historical yes. film. And so that's where we went. Christopher Nolan, actually, this came about because his wife is a huge Jeopardy fan. That is fan. so cool. And so when their team was first pitching various ways to put the movie out there and Jeopardy came up, she was like, 
yes, we have to do that. So we are sort of in a Christopher Nolan film here at Inside Jeopardy it with multiple like timelines <laughs> happening at the same time. It often feels like that. In the post game chat, Ken was asking Daniel because in that game, everyone had the lead at some point. And so he was saying, you know, was it your buzzer? Was there just like that your buzzer timing was kind of coming and going? And Daniel's like, <laughs> yeah, there was some of that. And there was some of just not knowing <laughs> the responses. He said, was it more like you had that dream board on Friday because you had such a great game? And he said, you know, honestly, I thought that these yeah. were the categories that I would have known more. So you just never really know. And we have to say, Jerry, what a great sport. You know, he initially <laughs> tried out over 50 years ago That's in the incredible. Art Fleming days, and he said it was worth it. 50 years of waiting, it was all worth it. So wow, thanks for that, Jerry. Thanks for waiting, Jerry, because we loved watching you play. And it was worth the wait for him. Yeah. On Tuesday, Daniel went for his third win against challengers David Betterman and Chelsea Watt. David hit his stride early with 12 correct responses and a daily double in the Jeopardy round. He continued his strong play in double, but Daniel was right on his heels heading into final. In that round, all three players were able to come up with the correct response, but David emerges the champion over our two-day winner, Daniel. Yeah, this was a great close game. I love these. I love the ones that end like this. Like This reminds me of my first game where you've got two players, you know, three players really, going at it. I mean, don't count Chelsea out. I know her total isn't quite there going into uh, final, but because of how close the other two are, very much in it clearly had some control of the board she hit those two daily doubles however not able to convert them take that four thousand and turn it on its head and she's got thirteen thousand eight hundred um very much in this game well if you had seen me on this particular show i was dancing in my seat (laughs) we had a category the songs of max martin max martin has done so many number one hits hits. and that includes hit me baby one more time he's got katie perry's song celine dion he's got kelly clarkson and so we had those songs featured from his broadway hit and juliet and this was really fun because again we don't have a chance really to to utilize music as often unless we are able to sign on with someone who actually wrote the music which max martin signed on for us to be able to use these clues If you haven't seen that show on Broadway, I highly recommend it. (laughs) It's like a rock concert meets a Broadway show. They take a really interesting take on the Romeo and Juliet story. If it had gone a little different, if Shakespeare's wife had more of a say in how that story ended, Mm. maybe Juliet doesn't just go ahead and kill herself for Romeo. This is all done through wonderful music. I highly recommend it. Uh, I did have a chance to see it. Yeah, take it in. If only Has, Friar Lawrence had gotten that letter in time, everything oh, could have been different. It could have been. And in this musical, it is. <laughs> David returned on Wednesday to face Sean Weatherston and Liz Cotrafello. David got off to a good start, building a lead in the Jeopardy round. But Liz came roaring back in double Jeopardy to take the lead up until David found that last daily double. He adds $4,000 to his score, giving him the lead, heading into final He gets final correct, and he locks up that second win. That was a great game. I'm going to shout out uh, the keen-eyed Jeopardy viewer might have noticed one Buzzy Cohen visiting his good pal Sarah Wickham Foss on the set during one of the bumpers. Yes, if you don't know the bumper shot, that's the little, you know, and we'll be back with more Jeopardy right after this. (laughs) Johnny Gilbert obviously presents that. Sometimes our director just takes a shot you don't know is going to happen, and Buzzy was coming to say hello. The cameras are rolling. Always great to see you on the Alex Trebek stage. I believe this was the tape day with the fly. Oh, my Can we talk about that? Goodness. Do we know if it was the same fly that landed on Mike Pence's head during oh, the... Well, it's multiple flies, let's okay. be honest. I don't know what was happening. We don't know if there's some critter got into the rafters, but we had a lot of flies on set. And we learned something about Ken Jennings. He is a keen fly catcher. Oh. Like just out of the blue, you'd see him put his hand up and clasp it close. He's Whoa. like, got one. I mean, I think he was up to like five Wow. that day alone. It was quite impressive. There were shots where you could see a fly like flying through the shot, so we needed to redo it. It was Lord of the Flies on Jeopardy, but we all <laughs> escaped unscathed. I do want to bring up the Daily Double, another story of like you never know how your life experiences are going to mm-hmm. help you on the show. David gets this one. The clue is, get your kicks on Route 66. Begin your historic road trip at the Begin sign in Chicago near the corner of Adams Street and this stately avenue. 
David responds correctly with what is Michigan Avenue. We learn in the postgame chat the only reason he got that correct was that he went to a wedding one week prior to this Incredible. tape day, stayed on Michigan Avenue. Ken joked that he hoped that he would be giving his friends a very large wedding gift. And he yes. Said, of course. Well, one other thing we learned, you know, everyone wants to talk about buzzer strategy. And so Ken was asking Liz, what happened in Double Jeopardy? Because she really didn't hit her stride until Double Jeopardy. And then she really got the hang of the buzzer. And she said that, you know, what helped her was looking at the last word of the clue as Ken was reading it. So as soon as he would finish reading that word, she rang in rather than waiting for the lights that many of you know are on either side of the game board once Michael Harris the enabler enables them Ken said that was more or less what he used to do as well what do you do do you I'm follow a the listener. lights do you I'm follow a, the I'm a host? listener but it is a very contentious thing in the Jeopardy community because I think James and Fritz are both big proponents of lights and I'm you know it's I'm, just that over anticipation though because then if you over anticipate the listen no, the, the lights. lights. Hence, maybe go off the listen, but not yeah. the lights. You can then lock yourself out for that portion of a second. I mean, hey, whatever works for you. It obviously worked for you, Buzz. It didn't work as well as lights work <laughs> for James, so you yeah. decide. I just always find it interesting that it's so much in your head about the buzzer, and clearly for Liz, she just got into her rhythm and yeah. it really changed within a game, and I think that's a great advice for our other contestants. Like, don't get in your head too much if in the Jeopardy round – you're not getting in because all the money is coming up in double jeopardy. Just stay calm, find your flow, stick with it. Yeah. This past weekend, I was telling some people about my Rocky training. And one of the things that <laughs> I got from my watching the movie Creed a lot, getting ready to be appear on the Tournament of Champions was one step at a time, one punch at a time, one round at a time. And I very much think that that's an important lesson for people coming on Jeopardy. Just take it one clue at a time. Do not get in your head if things aren't going your way because it can turn around in a second. I love it. Well, moving on to Thursday, David was going for his third win up against Nick Barry and Tula Ballas. David slowly built his lead throughout the Jeopardy and Double Jeopardy rounds, but Nick battled to work his way into contention. Both Nick and David unable to come up with the correct response in final, but a savvy second place wager from Nick got him the come from behind win. Nick goes on to tell us in the post-game chat, you know, Ken says, okay, you're a champ. You're ready to, to play again. And Nick says, always. And Ken says, well, you seem really calm. And Nick joked, you know, once you've stood in front of 39th graders, you are ready for anything. And he said, uh, hopefully Jeopardy will be less scary than your high school students. Yeah, I remember Alex used to always note that he thought that teachers and lawyers generally did very well on the show obviously they were very smart people but they were also people who were good under pressure good at thinking on their feet and uh, didn't get phased when things weren't quite going their way so I think that uh, Nick is certainly a continuation of that tradition well Nick heads into Friday's show as our champion going up against Ben Sasamoto and Taylor Claggett it was a slow start on Friday for all of our players, and that continued into the double jeopardy round. Neither of the daily doubles capitalized on, no one able to break the $10,000 mark going into final. Then from second place, Taylor is the only one who comes up with the correct response. What is 1666 to score that come from behind win? I love this final jeopardy. Yeah, this is a fun one. The category numbers old and new. Here's the clue. Expressed in today's numbers, it's the sum total if you add the seven Roman numerals together. What is 1666? As we alluded to, you've got I, V, X, L, C, D, and M. Whew, some quick math here. Standing for 1, 5, 10, 50, 100, 500, and 1,000. Ken was really impressed with Taylor for coming up with the correct response in final and that he didn't use any screens or do any math. And yeah. Taylor joked, he almost had to take off his shoes and his socks to count on his toes. <laughs> he didn't know that you were actually allowed to do any math and that if he had known, he probably would have. Well, I'm mostly worried about Nick, who has to go back and face a mathematics department. I know Roman numerals aren't technically a math thing, but it's kind of a math thing. So. I know. He said it's going to be okay. You know, his social <laughs> studies, the math department, they don't really coexist already. He said they already don't like each other, so it's fine. <laughs> so they're other ends of the we school. All, they don't mix. It's going to be fine. We all, you know, I think we all suspected that. And now, thank you, Nick, for <laughs> confirming you, Nick. it. All right. Well, that wraps up our game highlights. Congratulations to Taylor for an exciting come from behind win. I hope you enjoyed your weekend as a Jeopardy champion. Now, once again, in lieu of our viewer questions, it's time to question one of our Jeopardy greats, <laughs> Masters competitor Andrew He. 
Andrew, welcome to the pod. It's good to be back. <laughs> you look good. You look pretty rested, yeah. I might say, my friend. Do I? Yes. Yeah. There's there's good days and then there's uh, tired days. And yeah. Maybe now, today's a good day. How many months old is Everett now? Let our listeners know. He's in between three and four months old. Okay. I don't know. I don't know the right terminology, but... I think that's uh, he's accurate. He's like way too big at this point. <laughs> yeah. Way too big. Well, the good thing about having yeah. a big baby is that they can sleep through the night sooner because yep, they say they right. have to be, you know, a certain amount of pounds. You know, I feel like they always tell you this and that stuff and... I remember four months, 14 pounds. Okay. That's when you could start <laughs> expecting your child to sleep through the night. Well, speaking of timelines, it's been a little bit over two months since your last Masters show aired. What have you been doing with yourself since you spent like the last two years of your life on the Alex <laughs> Trebek stage, it seems like? Mostly trying to do stuff that will uh, distract me from my performance on the Alex Trebek stage. Oh, uh, Just trying on. to forget everything, you know, just temporarily. <laughs> Are you able to step away? Obviously, you know that JIT is coming for you. You'll be back on the Alex Trebek oh, stage. Oh, do I know that? <laughs> you do? Oh, yes. yes. I find this... out a lot of stuff on this podcast. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes, Andrew, let's let you in on a secret. The fourth, fifth, and sixth place finishers in Masters automatically advance to the Jeopardy Invitational Tournament. So... You've not seen your last days on the stage. Knowing that, are you able to at least, like you said, take a break, maybe not feel that pressure that you felt for so long to be preparing? I think so. I think uh, having a newborn kind of is a forceful way of, you know, separating you from yeah. the pressures of uh, <laughs> studying for a TV quiz show, <laughs> um, even if it's America's favorite. Um, exactly. Gives you some perspective. Well, I want to take everyone back kind of on a timeline because obviously everyone knows when Masters aired and it was this succinct, you know, few weeks that America loved. But we really started in mid-March. We had that promo day on March 13th. We had that first tape day on March 14th. And then we had March 15th. We did one episode. We went to lunch. And what happened, Andrew? (laughs) We went to lunch and normally... We're not supposed to have our phones on us, so I think I had my phone in my backpack. I just reached into my backpack because uh, I was like, I, I, I need to check this thing. You know, my partner is very, very far along. And even though we don't, you know, expect it to happen, you know, I just had a feeling. The text that I see, I, I don't think I knew exactly how to react. So <laughs> I did the only thing which made sense at the time, which was to read it aloud to the entire room, <laughs> which was basically, it's confirmed that I'm in early labor now. And so from then on, I, th- I think I, you know, have a small momentary blackout. <laughs> yeah. Yes. My like lunch plans drastically shifted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All of our lunch plans drastically shifted in that moment because of, of, course, course, of course, we heard the news and it was unanimous from everyone. We've talked about, you know, your fellow competitors were saying they can't make you play, Andrew. You've got to go. You've got to go right now. It's a short flight. Early labor can last a while. You've got to go now. And the minute Mm -hmm. that we heard, I think as producers, we were probably nervous about your competition and their reaction, not so much that we wouldn't want to also let you go, but the fact that everyone was saying, we've got to stop production, Andrew's got to get home. It was such an easy decision for all of us. Mm -hmm. And then it was just a matter of how quickly can Andrew get to the airport? How quickly can he get home? How quickly can he get to his partner? And you made it in plenty of time. Plenty of time, yeah. And that's thanks to so many people at the show. I truly feel that people move mountains to allow me to get back home in time. And what's great is that I'll always have this experience of, you know, in this very short time span, 24 hours, going from being on the Alex Breck stage, part of this inaugural Jeopardy Masters group of six, plus an alternate Chris, (laughs) who (laughs) I think you said everyone was nervous about about what would happen. I'm sure stuff was going through his head. (laughs) Yes, Um, exactly. (laughs) Although we had told all of the masters that once the competition began, we wouldn't be able to put an alternate in because there was no way to keep the fairness throughout. But Chris was there for those first tape days. And then we took a break. And so, again, I know when you came back and Ken said, hey, what's been up? And, you know, it's only been a few days in airing time. And you're like, I had a child. Yeah. But it was (laughs) quite a bit of time. We didn't come back until May. So at that point, you had a six-week-old What's it like to go from not being a dad and killing it in Jeopardy Masters to coming back as the parent of a six-week-old and knowing you've got a lot of game to play at this point? It's definitely stressful. I didn't expect it to be much more of a mental burden aside from just like, I'm a lot more tired now. (laughs) You know, maybe everybody else has taken this time to like prepare or, you know, kind of assess their situation in the tournament. You know, I, I had a little bit 
less free time to do that. But but the other thing that slipped into my brain was like, my son's here now and I have to put on a good show and I have to put my best foot forward. And I want to do that so that, you know, maybe there's something for him to be proud of at the end of everything. Mm. Well, take us through that last semi-final game. Yes. I know for Michael, <laughs> Davies and I, we're sitting next to each other and we're counting on our fingers because we know mm. the correct response is going back and forth. We know that probably the point total is going to be even and it's going to come down to one of those tiebreakers with the correct responses. Did you have any idea in your mind you know, where you were sitting at that point? I was pretty cognizant of it. Uh, I haven't looked back at the tape. <laughs> you, you can probably <laughs> understand why, but- uh, I understand. Um, I know that Matt, he took like this massive lead and I'm just trying to hang on, you know, trying not to get locked out. But ultimately, you know, you, you can do a little bit of simple math when you're close to the very end and you and you know what the situation is. And it's kind of a weird feeling because I'm well aware of all the different tiebreakers. I, I thought there might be a chance that we could tie on a tiebreaker on, on mm. the first tiebreaker mm -hmm. even. It's a little bit of a strange feeling knowing unless something really, really strange happens, uh, right. the final Jeopardy actually does not have an impact on who advances to the finals, which is, which is kind of a crazy situation. Very strange yeah. for Jeopardy, yes. Yeah. And so... Matea had a lot of strong runs where they were just dominant on the buzzer and you saw that in the finals carry through. And I, I felt that in some of our semifinals games as well. I had a lot of a lot of time, five to 10 minutes to think about this as Final Jeopardy played out. And I, I knew that the deck was kind of stacked against me, but you never really know the count. You know, I don't have the screen in front of me that tells me how many things I... <laughs> um, <laughs> It's a dangerous yeah. weapon. I mean, it's a new weapon we've had, and I will tell you, you don't want to know sometimes yeah. because I, I don't think it's you want, too I don't much think information. You want to <laughs> well, I do want to point out your stats yes. because they are very impressive. 170 total correct responses, 15 total match points, three first place finishes, and six second place finishes. Of course, we know you end with a fourth place finish. A mere hundred thousand dollars you take <laughs> home this time. We know you're coming back for the JIT. And I know you said your goal, you know, was just not to make a fool of yourself. But I really want to point out That's always the goal. That's always that's the goal. That's everyone's goal. Whether you're one not just on Jeopardy. Not just on Jeopardy. Yeah, in life. This is true. But Ken really did applaud you and he was so impressed with your deep knowledge. You know, there were so many of those high value clues that Ken thought, I don't think anyone's gonna get this, but if anyone does, it's going to be Andrew. So what is it like to know that the GOAT, you know, thinks so highly of your level of gameplay? That is unbelievable to me. I do think that one of the great things about having Ken host some of these tournaments, sometimes he'll say something and it, it just hits different because it's coming from him, right? Um, yes. You're in the middle of playing the game and then, you know, the greatest of all time just like kind of gives you a pat on the back. Like, I see what you're doing. I recognize that you got something that's pretty tough. You know, maybe he'll even sometimes slip something in like, oh, I didn't even know, know this one. Right. Um, it kind of just like raises your spirits just in the moment. Well, Sarah mentioned those very impressive stats. I know, you know, we've talked before about your uh, regular season stats, your TOC stats. Is there something that's maybe not in that top line, the stat that you are most proud of? Uh, something that I'm really proud of is that I tried to, and, and I actually obviously cribbed this off of a lot of past uh, contestants, but um, I really wanted to be prepared in pretty much every facet of the game. You know, sometimes people talk about Jeopardy being kind of this infinite landscape. Mm -hmm. It's not quite <laughs> infinite, I would say. Right. There's stuff that just keeps coming up. There's stuff like wagering that is part of every single game, you know, kind of preparing for the buzzer. That does show up in the stats, and uh, <laughs> I don't look super good there, but... <laughs> I wouldn't sell yourself too yeah. short there. <laughs> well, I would say I just tried to be as well-rounded of a player as I could possibly be based on, you know, where I was when I first started my Jeopardy journey. And I think that is something that I would love to see everybody strive to do. Yeah. You know, just be as well-prepared as you can. Masters was so successful, and it really was because of the camaraderie and the relationship between the six of you. You know, there were skeptics. They said, oh, it's only the TOC rematch and James. What do you think, what was it about the combination, the camaraderie, the gameplay? Like, what made Masters so fantastic in your mind? I definitely saw some of that stuff from the skeptics, and I, I kind of knew that it would be a success because 
at least five out of the six of us had so much history. And then you think about how the schedule of masters, which you kind of revealed a little bit about, we went down to Culver City quite a few times. Over, Many more over times than of... any of us anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. So, so kind of in that process, we're doing lots of shared meals. We're going out uh, for coffee. You know, we're having like chats about life and that sort of thing. And I think this was just a really good bunch. Everyone put, really puts their best foot forward when they're playing the game. Uh, James is the real deal, obviously. You know, he kind of g- got us all started, right? He, <laughs> he, he kicked it off with, you know, his self-proclaimed game show villain. Yes. That sets a little bit of a tone. You know, when you're playing against a villain, you know, you can't always let him have it the way he wants. <laughs> I think it was it was great that we were all able to kind of show a little bit of our personality. There were some moments that you wouldn't get if it was just one returning champion and two people that they've never seen before, right? Also, you you just got Sam Buttry. Yeah. Oh, I know. (laughs) We love everything about Sam. But you did mention James Holtzauer. He was new to the mix. The myth, Mm. the legend, you know, what was James when you actually got to meet and compete against him? He is very fierce. He's the real deal, you know? You can see why he won all those games in such dominant fashion. We had some wonderful conversations. Actually, one of the best pieces of uh, parenting advice I got was from James Holtower, which is a bit strange. (laughs) Yes, what was it? In classic James form, it was, don't let anyone tell you that they know what they're doing because nobody knows what they're doing. (laughs) And I took that to heart. That's good. And so I don't get too tough on myself when, when I can't figure things out. I just, I have to give a little shout out to the most recent Everett photos I received. (laughs) True Andrew humor, there were three photos. And three different expressions from Everett. Can you paint the picture for our listeners? It's a three photo series. The first one, he's just like very happy, like just (laughs) big smile. He's laughing. Second one, he's like looking a little skeptical. It's like something's going on. He's a little suspicious. And then the last photo is he's, it's basically a face poem. (laughs) And I sent these over and I, I think I captioned them. This is my reaction at the end of the quarterfinal. You know, the happy (laughs) one is... At the end of the quarterfinals, the middle one, the little little bit like not sure of where we are right now is uh, in the middle of semifinals. And then, you know, obviously uh, to get ousted from there is a little bit of a face palm. It was well fought. <laughs> well <was> fought. Awesome. <laughs> uh, I want to know how you fuel. This is the other question I ask everyone. Mm. What is your lunch order when you are here at Sony? It was very different during the TOC versus uh, <laughs> during Masters. Okay. During the TOC, I definitely remembered that James had said, I just eat, you know, pizza and Doritos or whatever. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I kind of need some of that real champion energy. uh, (laughs) So I I went for the pizza and I went for the Coke Zero uh, to get a little jolt of caffeine. This time when I went back, I was like, it's an exhausting process. I got to take care of myself a little bit better. So I kind of went the opposite way and I did kind of the Matamodio thing. And I pretty much ordered, I think, the the vegan option um, Mm. on the menu every single time. Interesting. Now, looking ahead to the JIT, now that you know you'll be there, (laughs) we've talked about, you know, Masters really is the best current champions. And so a lot of people were critical about this. You know, there are only six people. How are these the best of all times? And we said, look, we're going to have this other tournament. We're going to have the Jeopardy Invitational Tournament. We're going to bring back other greats from seasons past. And you know what? If you can prove that right now you can compete at the highest level and advance to Masters from JIT, then you absolutely will have a spot. Looking at that, not knowing who the list could be composed of, is there any Jeopardy great that you haven't competed against that you'd like to have a chance to compete against, perhaps in the JIT? Basically, the question is, how much time do you have? Because uh, ah, I like that. It's a very long list. I don't know who all is behind the scenes making this decision <laughs> happen. I really do not envy that. The, the list is just so long. You've got one person sitting there in the studio with you right now. Buzzy Cohen. (laughs) I think it's done just fantastically and would be a fierce competitor. Um, Means a lot. Just off the top of my head. I'm going to have my recency biases here, but um, I would love to see, you know, Sam Cavanaugh there. I think Brad has been mentioned before, Brad Rutter. I think he should just be directly in Masters. I'm just going (laughs) to say it right now. I know. Um, Brad's a tricky one because, again, we had to look at most recent appearances on the Alex Trebek stage. And that was GOAT. But I'm not putting out any spoilers, but I absolutely have Brad Rutter on our list. And I want to see him back on the Alex Trebek stage as well. I'd love to see him going up against Andrew He. Yeah, come on. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> Who else is on the <laughs> oh, list? Oh, my goodness. Colby, um, yes. Larissa, Kelly. Yeah. Uh, Roger Craig, obviously. You know, there's a YouTube clip, I think, of Roger Craig going all in back to back on Daily Doubles. Oh, yeah. It's probably got a couple 
you know, hundred thousand views or something or millions of views. Maybe I don't know. I don't even know. But half of those are like me watching that video. So, <laughs> um, I think Erica Hasek because um, you know if you look back to our TOC semifinal, he ended up having to play two Jeopardy Masters. I think he did pretty well. If you go back and look at the game, it, it's a pretty wild game. I would definitely toss in Eric's name, Chuck Forrest, who mm -hmm. I think everybody who plays like a modern style Jeopardy strategy, yeah. you know. He's the um, Dick everyone, Fosbury of Jeopardy. He is, he is. He reinvented um, <laughs> something that was very core that set in motion a really exciting style of gameplay that you see a lot these days. Well, I'd say you have quite a list working. Yes. And our stats team wow you should see our list so. <laughs> it's not a position that i would want to be in <laughs> a 40-year history of amazing champions i get you know i'm right there with you and i think like you andrew we're all fans of so many people on this show so it's exciting it's gonna be good now what do you do to combine enjoying life being a father but also knowing that you do have to kind of keep your game sharp a little bit like will you be able to balance that in the coming months would you say I'll try my best. You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty competitive person. You know, it's going to stick in my craw a little bit that I didn't quite make the top echelon. You know, if I take a step back, though, I think about just this entire journey and how, you know, I just wanted to play one game. <laughs> and now if I if I do the math right, I've gotten to play 24 games. Wow. That's a ton of experience. Mm -hmm. I've worked my way through two pretty tough tournaments. Mm -hmm. At some point, I will be able to put the competitive hat on and make a real run for it. Well, I don't think we can call you the dark horse anymore, Andrew. No. That's for sure. Well, yeah. I mean, we dark horsed our way all the way exactly. here. Exactly. <laughs> that term is behind um, you. The funny pattern that I've noticed is that even though I keep getting eliminated, like every single time <laughs> I've been invited back to play Jeopardy, I end up playing more games than the last time. Mm. The first time I was on the show, I got to play six games. And then I came back for the TOC and I got to play, in, I think, eight games in the TOC. And then I played 10 games of Jeopardy Masters. I think there's a little bit of a pattern there. Oh, mm. I like it. It's it's kind of bizarre world Jeopardy where, you know, yes. uh, you get eliminated and then they just ask you continually back. It's yeah. the new normal, Andrew. Well, before yeah. we leave you, I just want to know, you know, looking back on the past couple of years, what has been the best part of your Jeopardy journey? Oh, my goodness. I have a lot of moments to be proud of. I remember in... One of my post-game interviews, Jimmy asked, did you pattern your game after James Holtower? Because you kind of had some really bold bets there. And I said, of course. Like, I think James is a big reason why a lot of people, you know, decide that they wanted to make a run at this. And then kind of the very next question that he asked is like, you're about to face, you know, Matt Amodio in the Tournament of Champions. Like, how do you feel about that? And <laughs> for me, I, I think I made this gesture with my hands. I was like, well, I'm here. And Matt Amodio is like up here, you know. And to come back to the stage for Masters, game one, I'm thrown in there with Amy and Matt. Ken is hosting. If you look at the leaderboard of Legends, that's your top three. <laughs> and so for no rhyme or reason to it, I was able to win that game. Yeah. I think I will carry that feeling for the rest of my life. That's a special in-game moment. I think outside of just the game atmosphere, I've been able to be back and around the production crew so much and we've sh now shared this like life experience where you all like really went above and beyond i'm actually sitting on this like jeopardy masters oh yes the <laughs> blanket mega board right blanket that we sent you <laughs> that's like one of everett's favorite blankets and you mm. know it's kind of like everything is so synergistic if ever it's like playing on on this blanket i think about you know jeopardy i think about all the crew members people that i've just gotten a chance to see over and over again how wonderful everybody is and then I watch Jeopardy and I think about my son, you know, <laughs> it's something that is very intertwined with my life, I would say. Well, Andrew, always such a great opportunity for us to get to talk to you. You know, we see you on the stage and you are just such a fierce competitor. With great style. With great style. Great style. <laughs> but just such an incredible human. Yeah. And I always say it. I'll say it again. We do not get to pick our ambassadors. But how lucky are we that you are one of our Jeopardy greats? Thanks for joining us. We'll see you back for JIT, my friend. Thank you, Buzzy. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you to you know, everyone behind the scenes, for sure. Always great getting to speak with him. A really special human. Just another one of these great jewels in the crown of Jeopardy. That is it for today's show. We'll be back next week to discuss the final week of shows for season 
39. Yeah, kicks off tonight. And in addition to highlighting our last week of games, Jeopardy! Masters finalist and 38-day champion Matt Amodio will be joining us on the pod. Won't want to miss it. As always, subscribe to the podcast, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social, follow us at Jeopardy! on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on TikTok. And send us your questions and your comments and anything you want to see in Season 2 of Inside Jeopardy! to Inside Jeopardy Podcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next week. Hey, Ken, what's that thing the kids say? You mean smash the like, subscribe, and bell button so you'll be the first to know when we upload more great videos? Yeah, that's it. Do that.